How you doing today, Brian and John? See, can't doing forget good, John. Nick. He's here. So that's right. Hey, I am here excited, indeed. Excited to be wrapping so, up uh, season three with with such a cool topic. Yeah, it was a good one. And uh, what a, this was John's topic, really. And I if he just wants to, you know, give it a minute, let listeners know what they're going to find in today's episode. Well, what we hope you'll find is a very efficient conversation on the topic of effectiveness. Um, but we, we took some time going through a few uh, interesting quotes that we'd come across about uh, efficiency and effectiveness, the difference between the two, uh, when one might be appropriate over the other, and when you can combine the two, what an, uh, what an important and powerful tool that is for the leader. So I uh, hope you enjoy the conversation. I got a lot out of it, as always, and hope our listeners will as well. Spoiler alert, it's not an efficient conversation, but it is very much a lead.exe style yeah. conversation. Hey, but it's effective. It's effective, right? That's right. We cover a lot of territory. There's, there's a lot yeah. of circuitous paths. There you go. There you go. And, and you know, in, in honor of being efficient, let's let our listeners get on with the show. Let's do it. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Lead.exe, where we are hacking the leadership code. I'm Brian Comerford. I'm Nick Lozano. And I'm John Abbott. We all said that like we were uncertain, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I never know who I'm going to be when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> who put a question mark on the teleprompter? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... Well, welcome, and uh, looking forward to getting into this topic. John, you uh, you circulated um, this thing. I, I'm not sure what this is from, the personality ethic uh, snippet that you sent our way, but it looks sure. pretty cool. It's well written. Yeah, so folks that uh, might be fans of Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People um, might notice that passage. I was gifted one time several years ago um, this daily reader living the seven habits of highly effective people um and on the days where i'm on my a game i try to spend some time uh, every morning doing some journaling and reflecting um and this is one of the things among a few other uh readers that i refer to or i try to refer to on at least a daily basis um and it just kind of helps you think about some things gives me some ideas on what to journal um and it uh hit the other day in my in my daily reading so uh, january 4th it looks like it was um which prompted me to send out a message to my team at work about efficiency versus effectiveness um and then i thought it might be a good topic for us to discuss today so that's that <laughs> so that's where yeah. it came from brian <laughs> no i love it you know we were uh we were just in in philadelphia over the holidays and uh we went to independence hall and you know we were checking out uh, just kind of all this classic historic stuff. And um, one of the quotes that uh, that I saw that, you know, kind of it made me draw a connection to uh, to this concept of effectiveness versus efficiency. It was one from Benjamin Franklin where he says, better well done than well said. Mm. Indeed. Mm. <laughs> Good old, Unless good old it's a things. steak, then you're going to want medium rare at least. But. <laughs> that's true. I mean, if you're going to eat well done steak, you might as well just have a hamburger. That's that's yeah. just my opinion. <laughs> so on that's this, a, that's a good so, sentiment, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> so on this topic, I think um, you know, obviously, Covey's not the first person to talk about efficiency versus effectiveness. Um, two of the other quotes that. Um, I thought of immediately when I read that particular one were, were from uh, Drucker, um, who's another famous management writer. Um, I don't know when he passed. I think it was in the, I believe he passed in the 80s or the 90s. Um, but uh, the point being that, you know, one of them was efficiency is taking, is um, is doing things right, where effectiveness is doing the right things. Um, right on cue, Nick. Great. Um, so I think that what's neat about this quote is that I've, also seen Peter Drucker quoted saying that management is doing things right and leadership is doing the right things. Uh, I don't know if he coined that particular quote or not, but I thought it was interesting. I had never seen, I'd seen the management leadership um, juxtaposition before from Drucker, but I'd never seen this one on efficiency. So um, I think that'd be, that's something we could get into today about 
maybe management is efficiency, whereas leadership is effectiveness. Um, I'm not sure that's always the case, but that could be a fun thing for us to explore. Um, and then the other Drucker quote um, that's a personal favorite of mine, that uh, especially if I'm being a little little cheeky with a project at work or, or talking about why are we really doing this thing, is um, nothing... There you go, Nick. Thank you. Uh, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all, um, which in shorthand is it's entirely possible to drive really, really fast in the absolute wrong direction. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about this, uh, Nick, when we were discussing strategy uh, a few episodes back. So um, I thought what well, might be a good way to kick this off um I guess we've been talking for a few minutes, so we're kicked off, but the good way to dive deeper into the discussion um, would be a question for the two of you is first, you know, how do you determine the difference between efficiency and effectiveness in, in your work or in your daily life? I've got a pretty simple answer for that. Effectiveness is getting things done and getting things done well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'd agree Nick, with Brian, too, on the, the effectiveness, that effective is, is getting things done and doing them well. And efficiency is, is like you said, doing the things that you should be doing and not doing the things you shouldn't be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you're you're good at something and you're being effective doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing that, right? I could be very effective at uh, making this podcast sound great, but if the content's not good, like, what what, what good is that, right? Is that is that like sort of a an inside message for us to be better prepared at the beginning of episodes <laughs> like this one? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think efficiency also often gets tied to speed, and I think there is certainly a component of that, right? You you want to be able to deliver things, uh, you know, quickly, efficiently, um, but. You know, for me, efficiency is also cutting out all of those things that, you know, it, it may be uh, a lot of rote steps that can be easily automated and actually are less error prone if you hook them to some kind of automation versus just continuing to, you know, kind of spin your wheels on all of those things that have to be done again and again. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I think... Um I might see it a little bit differently. Uh, you know, I, I tend to think the the blanket statement "getting things done" still falls a little bit into the efficiency bucket for me, um, because what's the what's the qualifier for making sure that those things that I'm getting done are the right things to get done? And that, to me, is where I draw the line: is that um, efficiency is, you know, as you two have said, getting things done. Maybe not necessarily quickly. Not necessarily. You know, you can you can be efficient without being doing things in haste or, or sloppily. Um, but are those things that you're doing, however quickly and efficiently, um, are they driving you towards your strategic goals or, or the desired end state that you're looking at? You know, to use a, a really simple metaphor, um, you know, if you've ever been a canoe or a kayak, there's a, there's an efficient way to paddle and there's a not so efficient way to paddle. Um, Brian, I know your son's into swimming. There's there's an efficient way to swim, um, and then there's the uh, the old doggy paddle that that we've all seen. So you know, are you are you swimming efficiently? Great, but if you know if your if your son was in a swimming meet and he was doing a perfect freestyle stroke, but he was swimming sideways across the lanes. You know, still not going to win that race, right? So that's, I think, where I draw the line between that efficiency and effectiveness pieces is, is are you are you aiming at the right target um, and efficiently working to get towards it? Um, so that's my thought on that particular topic. And, and it can be difficult to know the difference, um, especially if you're an individual contributor on a team, is, uh, which is something I think we can explore too, is you're asked to do this thing. Great, I'm going to do it efficiently and, and quickly and and learn, you know, some hacks to get it done faster, and and to maybe cut some parts out of the process without cutting corners, etc. Um, but at the end of the day, how as an individual contributor do you know that that's driving in anything that's worthwhile or worth your time? Um, and I think that's the leader's job is making sure that the team, the thing their team is doing efficiently, um, is also going to be effective for the organization. So, any thoughts on that from you guys? 
I think those are all good thoughts. I mean, um, th there's been this huge trend in tech recently about running lean startups, right? And um, a lot of it kind of stems back from Lean Six Sigma, which came from the manufacturing thing, and then which is a spin to of you know Six Sigma of of fame that came out of what GE, right? Um, and a lot of it takes those concepts of efficiency. Um, and effectiveness and takes it from a manufacturing perspective and applies it to, uh, you know, running a startup, right? Doing your, what they call gamble walks, which is walking around, seeing how things are doing, seeing if things are effective, measuring things. Um, so I think it's something that's come to light recently, um, especially, like I said, in the startup world where there's pressure, where there's VC money and venture capitalists are looking for exit strategies. So, there needs to be some type of measurables, right? That this company can be profitable. So I don't know if Brian has different thoughts on that, but I think it's something that's that's hugely big in, in the startup tech scene right now. And I'm starting to see it flow out to even outside of tech where, uh, you know, the agile starting to go to different organizations and the Lean Six Sigma start to come out. What, what are your thoughts on that, Brian? Yeah, so, you know, kind of, one of John's comments sort of prompted, uh, you know, some additional reflection for me. Yeah, I think, you know, walking into answering that question, there was a presumption that uh, you are moving in a directionally correct, uh, you know, uh, mode of delivery. Um, but uh, but I think it does, it, it brings up, you know, a lot of good paths to explore uh, related to how you actually identify that. And uh, while I think it is uh, the leader's role to ultimately, uh, you know, be accountable for the effectiveness, uh, I think that even as a contributor, you can be, uh, you know, in part responsible for the strategy that helps drive you to being directionally correct, you know, and, and that's part of what I um, now kind of getting to your point, Nick, that's part of what I love about uh, Agile and, you know, particularly about being a scrum master. Um, you know, as a scrum master, you're in the center of uh, sort of helping to negotiate uh, a lot of different tasks, uh, you know, sizing of uh, workload uh, and, you know, priority in terms of sprint for delivery. But you yourself are not necessarily the one, uh, you know, who's, who's inserting yourself into the process, uh, you know, to drive that. Um, you know, as a contributor, you're, you're more sort of a facilitator for the whole thing. Um, but you know, when you're doing something common to agile methodology, like a stand up, and you know, everyone's just spending 15 minutes there and you're going through typically three basic questions, right? What did you get done? You know, what are you going to do? And what are those obstacles that are in your way? And as you go through, you know, that, that process, I think that's where there is really good dialogue that takes place to sort of create some assurances um, that you are directionally correct in, in what your delivery looks like. So it sounds like the leader, if, if I'm going to keep using my canoe and kayak metaphor um, that I started, we started in a kayak and ended with your son swimming. So I'll, I'll have to learn to stay on track with my analogies and, and metaphors in the future. It's going to interesting but, um, episode cover. Maybe we should find a guy in a kayak and put, put John's head on it. In, <laughs> incidentally, go. breaststroke would have been the stroke that I would have uh, gone with John. You know, freestyle, I mean, you can just kind of hammer away at the yeah. water and still get there freestyle. Breaststroke is, is truly awkward and inefficient just uh -huh. by design. <laughs> just by design, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not a great swimmer either way, so I just <laughs> I can I consider myself someone who doesn't drown, but I don't know that I efficiently Doggy move in any particular <laughs> direction. Is, right? Yeah, um, but you know to to think about a little bit what Brian was saying is you know if you're if you're in a boat, right? It's the compass. You know what what direction are we going? Um, and how do we know when we're getting off track for that? And and I think again, the there's variance in any goal, and there's and and you know we can say the the goal is is all the way out here, but we're approaching it from this way, and we might we might waver a little bit. And I think in the agile um, methodology, I'm not I'm not an expert, I'm not a scrum master, but I've been in a few projects using the agile methodology, and um, it seems like you know you do these sprints, and you you figure okay, you're you're working towards that minimum viable product, and and all those things that are tech terms, again, that are not typically a part of my day-to-day -day repertoire, but um, 
you might get off your your bearing might might change a little bit or your heading might change a little bit but you're still driving at that one particular direction so you can you can be effective um sometimes without being maximally efficient i guess is what i'm getting at right so the the shortest distance between two points is a straight line right but you don't always know that line um so maybe it's the leader's job uh you know, you have the managers that are there to make sure the tasks are, are on track and getting done, that everybody is, you know, moving their little post-it note to the other side of the screen. I think that's a scrum thing, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, but who's who's really stepping back and saying, okay, this is all great because it's moving quickly, but is the product that we're building here still the one that, that we need or that, that's ultimately um, going to provide value for us? So um, thinking in terms of almost cost versus return on investment. So... Um, you know, the, the most efficient way, if you're, if you're just thinking purely about cost, uh, is to not do anything at all, right? It doesn't cost you any money, <laughs> but, but you're not getting anything done, right? So, um, you can run an operation very efficiently, um, on paper maybe is, is what I'm getting at. Um, but are the products you're putting out, are they just, you know, if you're making widgets, are they of high quality? Are they what your customers need? Um, are they driving the market? I think that's fair points you, you bring up, right? And when we talk about efficiency and effectiveness, and especially when you talk agile, there's normally a lot of uh, different metrics you use to see whether something's effective or efficient, right? But then we have those things that are qualitative that we can't we can't measure put on a scale, right? Like employee morale, right? We could have super high efficiency, um, super effective, but employee morale's terrible, and in six months, the, the, everything's just going to tank. Uh, so I think it's a great point that you brought up that, you know, like some a lot of stuff for effective, effectiveness and efficiency is, you know, uh, quantitative. But there is that qualitative thing that we can't put in a box. And, and it takes a little bit more of the leadership side uh, to to figure out whether things are effective or not. Yeah, you have your metrics, but you still have to kind of throw in those those other things to see if stuff's still heading the right direction. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure where this uh, quote or anecdote came from, but, you know, there's uh, something to the effect of, you know, compass is going to show you true north, but it's not going to show you if you if you follow that path, uh, if you're if you're going to walk off a cliff or if you're going to, you know, find yourself walking into a swamp. Right there. There are those obstacles that have to be negotiated around. And, um, you know, part of the the delivery cycle with agile, um, particularly in cloud based you know, software delivery is oftentimes you create something that you actually put directly into the hands of the end user. And that's where you start to gather the feedback to determine whether or not you're directionally correct. So sometimes it's not even your own ideas at all, right? You've, you've put the ideas out there. You feel confident enough that you're actually going to invest time uh, and effort in building something. Um, but then it's not until you actually put it into the hands of someone who has to use it that um, you start to identify where there might still be friction in some of the touch points that have to be refined. And then you start going through some of those iterative cycles where you fail fast and you just yank it out completely, right? You know, thinking of something like um, Netflix where, you know, folks are accustomed to, they, they see a, a thumbnail for a movie uh, poster image and they want to know something about that image. Well, in the old days, you had to actually click on it and then it took you to another page and on that page, then you'd have a description and you'd have other buttons that would allow you to do things versus what the next iteration was where you just roll over the thumbnail pops open, you know, a window that gives you all that same information and you can just kind of keep cruising along the page without having to click back and forth through pages. Right. So it's, it's that kind of usability feedback that then helps reorient the direction of you know how you're refining ultimately what you're trying to deliver interesting so we, we've explored a little bit of, of efficiency versus effectiveness in, in product development or you know making widgets or swimming in your canoe um <laughs> but <laughs> so i i wanted to explore a little bit um on the leadership side of this and the the interpersonal relationships so what are your guys thoughts on being efficient when it comes to building relationships, um, whether they be professional or personal. Um, I guess the, the leading question way of putting this is, you know, do you try to be efficient with your wife or do you try to be effective? <laughs> Depends on the day, John. 
<laughs> Let me rephrase. Is a is efficiency um, is efficiency in in a marriage or any relationship? You know, is is efficiency a recipe for for long term sustainability of a relationship, or do you think effectiveness is? To make the question even more leading. <laughs> Oh man, that's that's a loaded question. Such a loaded question. I think, especially when you're talking about a significant other like that, right? I, th I think if I had to pick one, it'd be effectiveness, right? Because sometimes you do things that aren't always necessarily efficient, but you're doing it to make sure that something is effective, right? That that the relationship is being sustained, and you're putting the relationship first. So sometimes that means sacrificing efficiency for effectiveness. Um, that's my way of answering that. <laughs> That's that loaded question. I'll, I'll tell you what, in any of the relationships that I have in business that involve billable hours on the other side, I'm going for efficiency. <laughs> you know, um, yes, I'm, I, I absolutely want an effective outcome, but if I know I'm on the hook for uh, $225 an hour, uh, I'm going to try to get as much information crammed into 15 minutes and get off the phone, uh, you know, before I hit that 225 mark. Well, so that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, both of those, actually. So I, I would, again, as I was, it was a bit of a leading question. You know, when I think about efficiency, <laughs> um, you know, with my my wife or you know my my baby, it's you know, you know I'm not going to sit my three month down and be like, okay, we got 15 minutes. That was good quality time, and, and we're out. Right on to the next thing. It was a very efficient way of. Uh, we had good father daughter time. We're good, right? Um, so no, you want to be effective. You want to be there and present and and interacting and, and taking the time it needs uh, to nurture a good relationship. Now, the the billable hours piece is, is really interesting, Brian. There's there's the there's the provider versus customer, um, you know, give and take there, right? So uh, if I hire you at a hundred dollars an hour, um, I want us to be very efficient in that meeting. Um, I want to get my whole hundred dollars worth out of you, right? Um, if that's prorated, if I get done in a half an hour, great. Maybe I want to be even more efficient. But as a customer, I also need to make sure I'm I'm getting the quality out of what I'm paying for too. So maybe that hundred dollars is worth it, right? So there's this whole return on investment conversation um, that you got to kind of battle with, and I think that's why these words live together so often, right? You, you, there's a, there's a give and take a natural tension between effectiveness and efficiency. It might be more effective. Um, again, if I'm hiring you, Brian, for us to be able to spend an entire day together, um, going through all the options and all your skills and all the things that, that we can do on a particular project, but, but that's not efficient for either of us. And, and if I only have $200 and you bill a hundred dollars an hour, there, there are very clear limitations on what we can do here, right? So, um, really, what are you guys' thoughts on that that pull between the two and, and the tension? You're up from a leadership right. perspective, <laughs> yeah, from a leadership <laughs> perspective, I think this is part of why it's important to uh, kind of spell out the terms early on, right? So you don't find yourself uh, in the bag for uh, a ginormous amount of billable hours towards the end of a project. So that's just one example, right? But, but you know, in terms of uh, the leadership responsibility of setting direction, part of that direction is also, you know, where are we going to have contingencies in place? Where are we willing to have trade-offs? Uh, identifying kind of those boundaries um, that uh, allow you to, you know, ensure that you have a scope for the activities that are going to take place so that you can identify when things are out of scope and either you harness them to bring them back in or you jettison a part of what you're doing. Uh, or sometimes you jettison a team or a resource uh, because you realize, you know, we've got the order of precedence in this thing um, staged incorrectly. And, uh, you know, so, so being able to pivot, I think is an act uh, of effectiveness that also helps drive the efficiency for overall delivery. And that delivery is whether you're, you know, doing a product, whether you're doing a uh, an, an internal project, whether you're creating a new policy to put into enforcement for an organization. You know, when I think of agile methodology, I, I think of it in terms of pretty much every business context. I don't just think of it in terms of software development. I, I really do believe that. Agile is a you know methodology that can be applied across a lot of different types of domains.
met with resounding silence. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving that a little bit of room to breathe, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, where it, it, there's definitely a dichotomy with all of this, right? Like, there's times when you want to be more effective, and there's times when you want to be more efficient. And your swimming example or, or your canoeing examples, uh, perfect, right? It's like at that time when you're rowing that canoe, you want to be as efficient as you can so you're not burning as much energy um, and doing the the most amount of work that you can do with the littlest amount of effort, right? So it, it, to me, it always kind of depends really on what the end goals are and having that communication, right? Like Brian said, if you get on the hook, right, for 200 consulting hours, clearly up front, you weren't being effective in your communication, and laying out what the plans were and what your ideas are uh, from both sides of the parties, right? And we kind of see things fail like that too. If you ever been part of a project and you have a freelancer, expectations haven't been set on either side. So nobody knows what's going on, right? One side is expecting one thing and the other side is expecting another. Um, so I, I agree with everything Brian said. But I, the other thing I would add is that, you know, it takes that effective communication for you to be efficient, right? Laying out the groundwork, uh, what the expectations for work are up front. And we, we do that whether if it's with freelancers or employees or or teammates. You know, if everybody knows what everybody's supposed to be doing and what the desired outcome is and what the goals that we all are shooting for, the easier it becomes to be if more effective and more efficient in our day-to-day -day process because we know what our end goals are and we know what we're shooting for. Yeah, I think that's I love that you the brought up dichotomy. Sorry, John. No, go that's, ahead. That's, that's one of those words, man. It's like <clears throat> how, how how can you say that effective is more than better than efficiency, and efficiency is more than effective? It really depends, right? It's one of those dichotomies, right? One of those situations, and or. Yeah, well, it's. I think it takes it. You know, here's here's the thing to me. Probably the greatest challenge and greatest measure, in my opinion, of effective leadership is being able to negotiate the gray areas and you know when you when you bring up the term dichotomy nick i think that really uh, again displays that there, there has to be flex in in these things oftentimes and and you need to know kind of which tool <laughs> you're reaching for right or which approach uh, is appropriate at any given time just earlier this week actually we uh, i was explaining to my son you know he's 13 years old what the term fail fast means. Because to him, that, that had a lot of negative connotations. He's like, what? well, to fail, I mean, that's that's not what you're looking for. And uh, and so, you know, we talked about that. And I said, well, you know, give me some of your thoughts on that. What does failure mean to you? You know, and it's, it's to not get things done. It's to not achieve your goals. It's to, you know, there are all these negatives. And I said, <clears throat> once you've, you know, operated a little bit, you know, in, in the adult world, part of what you start to recognize is that failure is often the greatest learning opportunity. And that actually every success is built on at least one failure and sometimes many failures, right, that are underneath it. So to fail fast is actually a very positive connotation because the quicker you can get to those things that you're able to identify are not actually working in harmony with what are, whatever it is that you're trying to deliver, the faster you can lean those out and get to the things that that are going to help drive that effectiveness. Interesting. Yeah, I like that perspective. And, and Nick, you also brought up the word communication, which um, which I think is very important. And to to go back to my old my old uh, pillars that I always talk about, you know, the increase in clarity and reducing noise. Um, that to me is is effectiveness, right? Um, you don't want to say, especially if you're a communicator by by trade. Well, I communicated efficiently with that audience. Um, they have no idea what the hell I said, but it was very efficient, right? So you want to have a you want to have an effective message, right? Make sure it's something that resonates and then gets through. And that's whether you're a professional communicator um, or you know dealing with a an interpersonal you know a personal relationship, professional relationship, whatever. That that effectiveness in communication is absolutely pivotal. Um, however, I think effectiveness leads to efficiency. Um, if you're if you're crafting an effective message, which may take more time, right? Um, you're writing a blog or a book. It, it takes a long time to write a book. Um, getting getting a message, uh, there's that old, um, it's been attributed to a dozen different authors, uh, but 
Mark Twain is often quoted as saying, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. Um, you know, writing a short, concise message is incredibly difficult. Um, speaking concisely, especially even with prepared remarks, is, is it's a difficult thing to both be short enough to keep people's attention um, and to say what you really mean and get your message across. Um, you know, Abe Lincoln did this brilliantly. Gettysburg Address being a perfect example. Um, so, to me, it's it's those if you're increasing clarity, reducing noise, um, building trust, you're inevitably which is the fourth one, saving time, right? So uh, the communication piece on this is, is incredibly important, in my opinion. Yeah, I love that you bring up the Gettysburg Address. So over the holidays, we just went to Gettysburg and, uh, you know, got my son a, a copy of the Gettysburg Address, which ironically, you know, there's there's a book that it comes in where the explanation of the content of the address is the majority of the book, right? Because the address itself is just like a page and a half. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a wonderful book called Lincoln's Sword um, for those that are interested in history and uh, and good communication. That it shows, you know, it has photocopies of uh, some of origin Lincoln's original handwriting while he's writing speeches, and he is absolutely brutal on himself with edits. I mean, he'll start with what any of us would take up you know 10 pages to write and he gets it down to a paragraph by this absolutely cut through brutal editing process that as a communicator i love to read about but uh well there are several versions of the the gettysburg address that are out there as well that you can look at and compare and and that was uh part of the content of that book too so that's again that was uh one of my examples of uh failing fast right he got the address written that could have been given as it was, but there were like five more iterations before we got to the one that is now recognized as one of the most famous speeches in history. I like the failing fast, Brian. Uh, and I think some of that too, when people say that it's, it's not being afraid of failing, right? So that you don't have that hesitation. Fail fast, but it's okay to fail, right? Don't, don't be afraid to do it because that stops you from achieving something or attempting to achieve something. Just try not to fail at the same things over and over again, right? <laughs> I think, yeah, well, I, you know, I think the, uh, I was being a little, little cheeky, but I think the the point is that if you're, if you're failing, you need to be learning, right? I think there's a, um, you know, you can go on LinkedIn or, or Facebook or whatever and, 8,000 people have some meme up there and some beautiful script that says failure and about how Michael Jordan missed more shots than this, that, the other thing. And Wayne Gretzky, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And those are great quotes, but um, what often gets left out, I, I call it, I may have stolen this phrase from somebody else, but the a borderline fetishization of failure um, in the, in the entrepreneurial world is where we, we think that failing is suddenly the goal. And when we, when we say fail fast and that's not it, Jordan didn't miss a thousand free throws with the goal of missing the shot, right? It was it was the fact that hey, he learned and he adjusted and he and he took the chances and and he and he worked even harder next time. You know, every time he missed that game, what would have been a game winning shot, I I would have hated being practice with him the next day, right? I'm sure he wouldn't. I'm sure he crushed himself. So, which again isn't necessarily the right thing either to beat yourself up, but. The point being that failure is not the objective on its own. It's it's the lessons that failure can bring, um, and and that you should be striving to um, to succeed, right? And then be open to the fact that you might fail. Uh, and if you are going to fail, therefore, it is better to do it quickly in small increments um, than to get all the way to the end of a massive project and realize it was a total waste of time. So, I always like to. I, I think that the failure conversation is an interesting one. I always like to kind of nitpick at it just a little bit because it gets into that kind of slogany type world when um again it's maybe it's a very efficient message but is it a is it as effective as it might be i'm not sure well hence the second part of what is often added uh you know to that which is to fail forward right it's not just fail fast it's fail forward which i think touches on your point john that um there, there has to be this iterative process of improvement that goes along with the failure Otherwise, yeah, it's just Groundhog Day with not doing things well. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And eventually, I'm sure we'll have a, uh, I think we've talked about doing a, uh, a jujitsu and martial arts related podcast one of these days. Uh, and, and certainly there's a lot of um, 
failure over and over again in those processes. So I, I had to laugh a little bit when I when I gave Nick a bit of a hard time there about not failing at the same things over and over again. I can can tell you I've been choked out and arm barred about the same move about a thousand times, <laughs> but, but at least I know why now. It's just whether you can do anything about it is a, but that'll be a fun conversation about failure for another day. And as you bring that up, it's a great point that uh, with this episode, we're going to wrap up season three and start working on some great content for season four. We're going to try to have more planned segment, more more guests kind of. Um, we'll still do some of this great off the cuff content like what we're doing now, but we're going to try and get the show more segment driven, um, more more on a scheduled basis. Uh, do, anything you guys want to add to that? Just that we, you know, as much as we enjoy talking with each other, it's always a pleasure to bring in these other guests, and uh, and there are a lot of folks that um, that we've got uh, on our list, and you know that will be stepping in to contribute to the conversation. So that's that's part of what always makes all of us better, right? That's part of why we do this. It's it's the dialogue, it's the socialization of these ideas that uh, that actually help us build these layers on each other. I have nothing to add. I think that was a very efficient and effective way of uh, <laughs> letting our audience know what's yes. coming down the pike. So. Uh, it's, it's a 180. Right? It's a 180 from where we started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like I, our first episode's a, a dumpster fire, Brian. I love you, but it's 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 a dumpster fire, man, if we're going to be honest. but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, with it, with that, um, so we're going to go ahead and do one of the segments we have that's going to go in our next season, which is the 60 second leadership hack. And only one of us has to do it this time. So um, who's going to be the who, lovely volunteer? Who will it be? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that. Don't speak all at once. All right. Okay. I can do one. I'll, unless you're, you're going to do it. Itching to go. Hey, it's your topic, so I mean, it's we it's can a, a we can one. always do more than one and just save it for another time. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> okay, are you ready, John? I'll go. Can you see the timer in front of you? Are you ready? I can. Yep. Okay, here you go. All right. Oh, I didn't know there was such background music. I'm fired up now. Um, so this is an oldie and a good one, goodie, and I'm cheating a little bit because I've talked about this before on the podcast, but I have my trusty. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said by me now? Uh, sticky note that has succeeded in keeping my foot out of my mouth. Um, probably not 100% of the time because I can sure find a way to put it there. Um, but this is the, the instant improve your emotional intelligence and keep yourself out of hot water um, personal check. If you can ask yourself these three questions before you speak in a meeting or as alluded to earlier in the episode in a conversation perhaps with your significant other, um, it will save you a lot of angst. And I have 10 seconds to spare. Oh, man. Look at that. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. Wow. You didn't even like let the, the theme music ride out, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm not going to put the music in the episode because it might get tagged by YouTube. That, that oh, okay. timer said it had no music on it, by the way. But oh, okay, it's fine. It got me fired up to go. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> like you're in an Avengers movie or something, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. If you had one, by all means, we should we should record multiple yeah, if we have them. We can no, use them right. later. So no, I do have one, but I'll, I'll save it for another time because I think that one was great, John. Go. Cool. Yeah. And I think it tied in well to the content of, of this episode. Cool. Perfect. With that, we'll, we'll just wrap up. Um, if you're listening to this on any podcast player or uh, wherever you get it, if you could just leave us a review, let us know how we're doing, five stars, What? how many ever stars you want to give us. Uh, leave us a couple words. Let us know how we're doing, um, any feedback, any insight. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you could just go ahead and, and subscribe, slap the like button now, right? Is that what they all say? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that'll really help us, uh, you know, grow the show, grow the audience, and, and just help us, you know, reach more people and uh, bring better guests for you, some better content. We've got some great stuff coming up in season four. Uh, like I said earlier, this is going to be the end of season three, but we do have some more great content coming up for you. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm. Uh, Nick Lozano on LinkedIn. Uh, everywhere else you can find me as Ronan Janitor. Uh, what about you, Brian and John? Where can people find you, you fellas? Oh, yeah, LinkedIn. That's always the best place. 
Yep. LinkedIn is a great place to connect with me. Yep. Yep. (laughs) And I'm uh, John D. Abbott, not to be confused with my dad. Who was just John Abbott? <laughs> That's true. On, on LinkedIn, I, I have the privilege of usually being the first one to pop up on a search. But there you go. Uh, before the advent of LinkedIn, I, I never would have imagined that there are about fifty other guys out there with my same name. So <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing when you get that way, right? But it, the funny mm-hmm. thing is, John, it'd be funny if your dad starts getting comments on LinkedIn <laughs> about about his podcast episodes. <laughs> I'm going to send your dad some comments just because Nick said that. Go for it. <laughs> he already gets my mail for my Sirius XM subscription, so I don't know. It's, well, it's hopefully he's fan and giving you the benefit. <laughs> no, he just mails it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, everyone, uh, we appreciate you listening, and we will see you in season four. Love it. Thanks, guys. Thanks.